back to the CSS podcast. It has been many moons now since we've talked about color on this show, and there are a handful of changes that we want to ramp you up on. You could think of this as like a news show for CSS color. So some of this is niche color knowledge, some of its core functionality that's useful across the board. So grab a pixel paintbrush and some colors from your favorite color space, and let's paint a picture. Oh, that's so cute. It makes me want to do like a news thing like changes to OKLCH. CSS had adopted OKLCH, even though it was a bit young. I can't, I can't, I can't keep this up. But, um. I like it. I, I want you to keep going. <laughs> it would have been, it was fun for a second. Welcome uh, to the CSS podcast. Live. <laughs> we cover all the news from, it's actually probably would do pretty good. Someone out there, uh, run with that. It's all you. You got this. Um, all right, so yeah, changes to OKLCH. That's one of the things we need to cover is uh, little niche details have changed in there. It was, it was a bit young when we adopted uh, OKLCH into the color spaces of CSS and some ad adaptations needed made when we did that adoption. Um, and then we also needed to have some discoveries. We needed to watch people use it, see how things went. And we've seen health usage now and been through a few gauntlets of debate. And I want to update y'all on what is going on. One of the most surprising changes to folks, I think this even got you know once, is the changes to the L channel. Oh, yeah, recently. Yeah, for a temporary amount of time, uh, the L channel, if it was zero, no matter what the other values were, it would be black, just like HSL. And if L was zero regardless of what the other values were, it would be white. Um, and that got shipped in Chrome. And this was due to developer feedback. Developers pushed back and they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, it's, it's 100% light. Why is it still blue? Uh, and it was because they still had chroma and they still had hue. And so in response to that, the CSS working group talked about it. Anyway, they deliberated and said, okay, let's just make it white or black. That's, that's the expectation people have. And then that got undone. So essentially what we're at now is we're... Um, we're at the place where L at 100% does not always equal white. You need to make chroma zero in order to get white. These color spaces, OKLCH is a very, very large color space, and it has a color to represent at 100% lightness with a pale yellow or pale blue. Same thing with the dark colors. So you have to strip chroma out. You can use the none keyword if you like, or just specify it at zero, and you can reach uh, white or black this way. This also, you may not have run into this. This was a, Chrome was the only one that jumped on the deliberation and then Chrome had to undo the deliberation. So we are now at interop where 100% um, lightness and 0% lightness are not guaranteed white or black. So just know that when using that color space. Okay, that's good to know because yeah, this happened to me between Chrome versions for a presentation that I was giving where the background was like a nice light yellow transforming to peach and then it became a highlighter yellow and the latest canary this is a, a few months ago and i was just so unexpected where i was like adam what's happening <laughs> <laughs> yeah gradient.style had a bunch of uh, gradients that initially came out using 100 percent uh lightness for a pale yellow and then all of a sudden they turned into white yeah. and so then i had these gradients that went to white i'm like that's not what i want so i undid that on my tool and then i had to go back in and redo it on my tool because i liked how they were originally well it's good to know um, that we're at introp now and that you could have expected color values across browser and across this color space so yeah thank you for the update all right Welcome. next update with yuna and adam updates with colors and current color so current color initially was something that the working group deemed would be too difficult to integrate with color mix and other color functions, like when you're using it with relative color syntax. So initially, you couldn't use current color in color mix and relative color syntax. It just didn't work. But like many other things before it, similar to container queries, after more thought <laughs> and some deliberation, prototyping, and some neat code tricks for rendering engines, implementers have figured it out and as a part of Introp 2024, you can now include current color within these new mixing and adjusting functions. So now in all browsers, you can use current color as a color value in color mix and relative color syntax. Yeah, that's a pretty cool little trick. I think most of the issues were around the really confusing, which we have an episode on, parse time versus use time versus... Yeah. Uh, computed value time and all those sort of things. And current color is apparently somewhere in that chain that made it really difficult to be included in color mix because color mix was somewhere else in the chain. Yes, that makes sense. That all makes so sense. So there's like a, a resolution compounding issue that uh, I don't know how they figured it out, but 
they did. I'm happy. Cool. Uh, okay, now let's talk about gamut mapping versus uh, versus gamut clipping. So there's been a lot of debate about what to do when a color is out of gamut. Uh, and both sides have features, uh, gamut mapping and gamut clipping. Uh, and they also have values um, that are like valuable in each of these sides. And different people are valuing different features of these two arguments. And so you have um, a very split split set of folks that are looking at these two things. And ultimately, though, gam gamut mapping has won as it intends to return the closest color possible given the inputs. That's the whole point of gamut mapping was it was an intelligent way to take a color way out of gamut and put it in gamut, where gamut clipping was a very rudimentary way to do it. Um, and it was also computationally faster. Not like the, the, the computational speed really mattered that much, but it was that clipping is often pretty good, um, but people wanted it to be better. Mm. They also wanted some other things. So in initial implementations of these color spaces used gamut clipping uh, if a color was out of gamut. And this just means it grabbed the color literally at the edge of the best supported color space. And it had some benefits. Like I kind of like clipping for a lot of cases where the vibrant colors stay more vibrant in a clipping scenario. But folks who were depending on the colors to make accessible palettes found that clipping made it difficult to create predictable accessible palettes. And among some other things, they might have disagreed with where the color got clipped. There can be a huge shift in color uh, clipping where gamut mapping uh, tries to keep the hue. The hue is more important than the end color. So anyway, uh, implement implementations are now set to update to gamut mapping using an algorithm provided in the CSS spec. This algorithm, it might improve over time uh, as it's already improved in the past couple of years since its initial inception. The improvements that I'd like to see are maintaining the chromacity of colors. This is why I tend to what prefer- What is chromacity? Uh, that's its vibrance. So how much chroma, chroma is in the okay. color? Gamut mapping will sacrifice chroma in order to maintain lightness and hue, whereas clipping uh, will maintain its chroma as opposed to the hue. So those are some of the trade-offs. Um, and yeah, gamut mapping can return a kind of dolan color in comparison to clipping, but that's where I think the gamut mapping algorithm can uh, grow and get better is maintaining chromacity or chromaticity uh, based on uh, what what it is and how far it was out of gamut. So anyway, the goal of mapping those is reliability and not vibrance. And so it's a sacrifice most people are willing to make, but also like the mapping algorithm could be one day, uh, you know, made better to do this. The reality too is here, uh, many CSS authors won't run into these issues. It's a little bit niche, um, but to color folks, the fidelity of colors is really, really important. And the math and the science are critical in making usage seamless. They want people to have this be uh, really seamless to you. So I appreciate all the deliberation. There's still conversations going on about this, but uh, they all want to make a great color experience on the web. And so I think that's the healthy underlying factor here of these debates. Wow. Really cool. Also, chromacity, a new word that I learned. It might be chromaticity. Chromaticity. <laughs> I don't know. I said one wrong, then the other yeah. one. Right. Hey, we could say specificity on this show all day. We can say specificity. But... And guess what? Jake Archibald can't. <laughs> Yeah. Shout out I also to tried to say, <laughs> what was the arithmetic one I couldn't say? Anyway, arithmetic, hard. arithmetic. Oh, yeah. Last episode. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I know there's been a lot of discussion about gamut mapping versus clipping. I know that it hasn't been resolved yet. So thank you for the update. There's definitely you know, pros and cons and trade-offs. The next update is about contrast color. So uh, contrast color is a functional notation that takes a color value and compares it to a list of other color values, selecting the one with the highest contrast from the list. And the inspiration for contrast color really came from uh, Compass. So if you remember when SAS was the thing everyone used and Compass was an add-on to SAS, there was a contrast function that gave you the contrasting color value. I believe that one was only black and white though too, um, based on the background color. And that was really, really useful for creating accessible color palettes and dynamic theming, like you would automatically get the contrasted text for a button. So the contrast color function is now something that we want in CSS. And this function is still under development, but mostly it's stalled right now while it waits for a new contrast algorithm from WCAG 3.0 which some of you may know as APCA, APCA, or Advanced Perceptual Contrast Algorithm. The APCA algorithm is still incomplete at this point, incomplete at this point, but it is uh, available to test, so you could try it out. And based on the most recent projections, it's still probably around two to three years out from completion. So we still have some time before it's finalized. But because contrast color is of such high value to developers, we want this in the platform, um, there's a temporary middle ground 
that's sort of been sorted out and enacted as a partial implementation that could be prototyped and tested as a resolution from the working group. Um, and this would allow for you to contrast against a more limited set of colors, specifically black and white. So the full function would allow you to find accessible colors against a background or foreground color as provided by the author. So the author provides the list. So instead of just black and white, you could say navy or whatever colors you wanted to test against and apply. But the middle ground will simply only return black or white. And this is done by passing the max keyword into the function along with the color. So now the function will return either black or white, whichever has the higher contrast. And this works a lot like how accent color works with form controls, like the check marks and a checkbox, where with accent color, you specify like the accent color of your page. So let's say you want hot pink based on the contrast, the a uh, user agent determines if that check mark will be white or black on that hot pink background um, for your form controls. So this is similar. Uh, it also will aid in folks needing to pass government requirements in their color system. So it's still really useful. And if you really want this function and you want to prototype with it, we got to make some more noise about it, asking for it. Getting this on the platform is very much about developer interest, about folks that are, uh, you know, keen on making change, you could really influence browsers and spec authors to prioritize this if you want to. And that's true of all features. So if you're passionate about something, interested about something, reach out, comment in the uh, CSS working group, GitHub, leave use cases and examples of where you need this. Um, so hopefully we can get that soon. Yep, we'd love your help getting more attention on that one. Maybe get that one on Interop 2025. We'll see. I don't know. It's spec. Um, There's a spec. It's spec. Yep. And it's the full spec of it is really cool, but I'm down with the uh, compromise. That's nice. Just to get a white or black result off of a input color. That's great. Yeah. I could definitely use that. And that's how Compass did it. And that was really what inspired the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, Lira Veru recently posted that relative color syntax can make a similar a determination for a color. So if you can't wait for the contrast color function, but you do have enough browser support in your browser support matrix for relative color syntax, uh, go check out Leah Veru's article on how to use relative color syntax for that. Ooh, we'll definitely link that one in the show notes. That sounds really interesting. Uh, yeah, and speaking of relative color syntax, or as we like to say it around here is RCS, the none keyword has gotten a small update uh, when you are extracting values with the relative color syntax. If let's say you have a color that has a hue of none or a chroma of none, and you extract those colors into, uh, so you'd say from uh, this color, and this color has the none keyword in it, what does none turn into? Because you need to use calc on that value. So there was a determination that none now returns zero. So that way you can uh, complete your math inside of relative color syntax. So that's the the hot tip is none. Uh, when you extract it with RCS, it is now zero. Mm, that is a good tip. Good to know. Okay. The last piece of color news in this color news sec segment is we have a new function called light dark. And this is yeah. a really useful, pretty new function. Uh, it landed in Chrome 123, Firefox 124, and Safari 17.5. So available cross-browser since May 2024. Um, this function allows authors to toggle between two colors depending on the value of the color scheme property. And it can remove a lot of duplicate code that enables tighter coupling of a theme to the color scheme. So uh, definitely reduces a lot of code redundancy. Before the light dark function, you would have to specify your light theme colors, and then you open up a new media query for prefers color scheme, dark, and then you have to rewrite everything all over again inside of that media query and have to wrap that. And then depending on how you're applying the styles, you might have to have it in multiple places, um, which is quite annoying. But now you can do this without any media queries at all. So first, you need to have your uh, color scheme light dark set on the HTML root. And then you can simply say background and then use the light dark function with first your light value and then your dark value as arguments. So you could have a uh, light dark and then in parentheses, white comma dim gray, so that you'd get a white background when you had a light theme and a dim gray background or a darker gray background when you had a dark theme. This also makes implementing a theme switcher that goes between light and dark a lot easier because this 
switch just needs to specify the color scheme desired. Like in a dark mode, the color scheme is just dark. And then in all of your light dark color functions, it'll return the dark mode color. So it's just a lot easier to author visually. Uh, Adam has a great visualization for this too, where it takes the current state of the art. I, I guess now this is current because it's stable, but like the longer form where the traditional, you have, you know, all your theme colors in light, all your theme colors in dark to just putting it in one place directly in the element that you're applying the theming to, which is super convenient. And it's so nice. So I love these incremental authoring wins. Yep. I just built a theme this week using it. Um, it was quite delightful to not have to open up and have so much duplication. And the function just looks cool. Um, the function also light dark. I wish it uh, accepted more than colors. Like what if in a light mode you wanted uh, no border, but in dark mode you wanted a thick border. Uh, light dark cannot do that. It only accepts color values. Um, yeah. Which I don't know, maybe we'll get something else in the future that can do something you, more dynamic. You, and I think you still need your custom uh, media query for that. Your user yeah. preference query. Because I also for my website have uh, background images changing on the border like to create like an effect. And it only takes color. That takes you takes, color. takes you far. It does. And I believe Bramus, uh, and there's another version of this function that will in the future enable more than just light and dark. So here's a limitation of the light and dark function is it's only going to be helpful to you if your site only has light and dark themes. But if you have like a purple theme or a pink theme or a ketchup and mustard theme from Windows 97, um, <laughs> it won't be able to handle those custom color schemes because the color scheme property only accepts those two keywords, light and dark. But in the future, it could accept more of them, at which point those would trigger a different type of function, not a light dark function, but like a custom theme function. So your color scheme could be much more something we could compose and extend where right now we're limited to the light and the dark concepts. But check out Bramus's blog. I believe he's got a good article on there about how this can work in the future. Amen. Check it out. So yeah, thanks for joining us on our little news segment update on CSS Color. Dun, 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 dun. And if you have any CSS questions, we'd love to answer them on the show. Just tweet us with the hashtag CSS podcast. I'm at Una. That is at U-N-A. And I'm at Argyle Inc. A-R-G-Y-L-E-I-N-K. Your question could help a lot of people. And this is the point in the show in which I tell you that if you like the show, it would surely help us out if you left a review all about what do you like about it on whatever podcast app you're using, because we do read those reviews, or share this with a friend. That's another great way to support us. We don't do any ads, sponsorships. We are here to provide great content for you. And uh, this is how you can support us back, just leaving a positive review telling us that you like it. That's how we help other people discover this show and uh, also make more time to create more episodes. Yep. Thanks, y'all. And we look forward to your questions. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye.